Hello, I'm Greg. Welcome to my channel, Midnight Oil Software. In this video, I'm going to talk about how to abstract user input in Unity and why you should do that. And it's actually in response to some comments that were made on my YouTube channel by a guy named Andrew. He was commenting on my Joust tutorial and wondering why I created a player input manager that sat between the Unity input manager and my bird mover script. So I want to explain why I did that and what the benefits are and why you should follow that same pattern. But before I do that, I want to draw attention to the fact that my Highland Panic game that's going to be releasing on Steam is now available for open play test on Steam, as well as on the Apple App Store for beta. And I'll be opening up to open beta as soon as Google approves it. So, if you want to test it, go over to my Steam page and click play now. And do me a favor and wishlist the game if you haven't already. And while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel here and click like on this video. So let's dive into the uh, actual question that Andrew was raising and talk about how this whole conversation came about. So he basically commented on my Joust video and said, I have to ask, what is the purpose of input manager solving? What I see is you are using player input that sends events to another middleman that then sends more events. Is there something I'm missing here? And so I replied, I tried to clarify, um, and I said, yes, I have one set of events that the bird mover script listens to, and it doesn't care if they're fired by a human or by an AI. If I can swap out input controller implementations without changing how input is consumed. So I thought that was a pretty clear explanation, but apparently it wasn't clear enough because Andrew said, but it's still sitting between player input and your script, is it not? That makes no sense to me. Why would you write the same thing that player input does, but make player input events go to your events that then go to the final script? So what Andrew is describing here is literally the definition of abstraction. So what I have done is I've abstracted the user input, and I don't wanna just throw terms around without defining them. So abstraction is basically something that separates, uh, it's used for separation of concerns. So I'm separating the implementation of user input from how it's used. Um, another way to put this is I'm decoupling the user input from the consumer that's using the user input. Uh, and these are very common uh, practices. You see this everywhere. You see it for data access layers. You see it for like logging. You have an iLog manager that decouples or abstracts or separates the implementation of logging from wherever you want to log something. So you don't care how it's being logged. It could be logged uh, to your console. It could be logged to disk. It could be saved up to a database somewhere. Uh, you just don't care. So in this case, I'm actually just abstracting the user input so that I can have different sources of input. And I'll get to that in more detail later, but let's keep following along. Uh, I responded to that question by saying input manager, I input manager is an interface. It is just a contract for anything that handles input. There is an input manager base class from which, uh, from which other input providers can derive. In the case of my Joust game, it's either a player input manager or an enemy input manager. By abstracting it in this way, the same bird mover script can be used for both human controlled birds and enemy AI controlled birds. They just provide input in quotes, that the bird mover consumes without caring where the input comes from. And I added to that, that after I had published my Joust tutorial, I was watching a tutorial by CodeMonkey, uh, where he was talking about how he implemented simulating multiplayer with AI. And he used pretty much the exact same pattern. And so I commented on his video and said, dude, I used the same pattern in my Joust tutorial. And he commented and said, yeah, it's a super useful uh, pattern. Uh, I also provided a link to a blog post that showed an example of how to abstract user input. Um, and then I mentioned that while I didn't say it in my Joust tutorial, one of the benefits of abstracting input like this is that you can mock it and make your code testable. So you can have unit tests that simulate user input because you abstracted the actual implementation of the user input. So he replied again, how is that a good design pattern it is just a person like you and I who suggests a way to do something. Doesn't make it a good design pattern. So, I mean, I guess he's saying, well, just because I, I linked to that blog post or CodeMonkey says it doesn't mean it's a good design pattern. Um, and so I tried to point out that I'm basically using what's called the observer pattern. My 
Bird Manager script subscribes to input events. It doesn't care where those input events come from. It doesn't care what the implementation of those input events are under the cover. So I said, it's called the observer pattern. It's widely recognized as a very good pattern. It's not just me saying, do it this way. By abstracting this, the bird mover can observe input events without caring whether the input came from a human pressing a button or an IA script firing the event. To which he replied, I know what the observer pattern is and I know when to use it and when not to use it as well. What I'm still trying to understand is why you have the same pattern in the middle of another. So again, this is the classic definition of an abstraction layer. I had this pattern in the middle of another because I am abstracting or decoupling or separating the implementation of input from how it's consumed. So that was the definition of an abstraction that he basically gave in his question. Um, and then I also added to that because it seems like I'm talking past him that I'm not really making this clear. And by the way, I want to go back to where he said that this makes no sense to him. If this doesn't make sense to him, then that's totally a reflection on me. If I'm teaching something in a video and somebody watching it doesn't understand it, if it doesn't make sense to them, then that means I did not explain it clearly enough. That means I need to do a better job to make it clearer and understandable, which is why I'm making this video. I want to try and take another crack at this and see if I can't explain it a little bit better and hopefully um, remove any confusion that's uh, behind this. Um, so I added to that. I said, I guess I'm not understanding the issue you're describing. Please post on my Discord channel and include some code snippets or diagrams explaining what you think the issue is. I feel like we're talking past to each other. But to summarize, I have two totally unrelated sources of input, human input and AI input, that must be handled the same way by the listener. For example, the bird mover. The abstraction layer allows me to substitute one for the other without the listener caring in the slightest what the source of the input was. And as I pointed out earlier, this layer of abstraction allows me to mock the input source, which enables me to test the components that receive input, or that's me write unit test. So let's switch over to Unity, and I'm gonna describe this by giving some examples. So this is the Joust tutorial that Andrew was commenting on. And in here, I'm gonna look at my prefabs folder. I've got this uh, player prefab. And you'll notice that the player prefab has a bird mover script, and the bird mover takes an input manager. And if we go and look at this script and look at what input manager is, it's input manager base. Now I had to add an extra layer of abstraction because of the way Unity works. Uh, I couldn't just make this an interface. I couldn't just make this I input manager because I want to be able to assign this in the inspector in Unity and Unity won't let me drag an interface onto here. So what I did is I have a base class and the base class doesn't really do anything except give me the interface. Um, I have a property on there called input manager that as long as my instance isn't null, I call git component and say, give me the I input manager interface. So that's the only purpose of the base class. Uh, really just think of this as an interface. And in fact, down here, I just cache that interface to this property right here. And so wherever I wanna check for input, I just ask my input manager, did I move left? Did I move right? Did I press jump? And I don't care how this interface is implemented. All right, I have separated the concerns of input from the implementation. I have decoupled the implementation of input from how it's consumed. So this is actually one of the original structural design patterns that was part of the gang of four. So decoupling is a structural design pattern that's part of the gang of four, and that's what I'm implementing here. It's also an example of the dependency injection pattern and inversion of dependency, which is the I in solid. So it's part of the solid design principles as well. So going back to Unity, um, I want to show you, I've got my player, which has a player input manager. So I am passing in a player input manager to Bird Mover because that implements I input manager. Well, guess what? I've also got an enemy. The enemy also has the exact same script 
the same bird mover script is used to move an enemy that's used to move the player. And in there, I'm passing in an enemy input manager. So this guy, instead of taking the input from the player input controller, Unity's player input, it's taking an AI uh, logic to fire those input events, to send that input of information. So the same script works whether I'm an enemy or a player. Now I could not have done that if I had just assigned the player input directly to the bird mover. So I think part of the confusion is I've got this player input manager. Um, and I think that that is what's really confusing Android, Andrew. I don't know why I want to call him Android, but I'm sorry about that, Andrew. I hope you forgive me. Uh, but anyway, this player input manager is what has an actual player input component on it, which is a Unity player input. And so Unity's player input through its action map is going to call this on move, on flap, and on quit. And like Andrew correctly observed, I am passing those events on to anybody that's subscribing to them on my player input manager class. So, and if you look at the interface, it's basically just exposing those inputs and this vector to movement. So by doing it that way, I'm totally abstracting this player input implementation from anybody that's consuming that implementation. So the benefits of that are, let's say I wanted to refactor this. Let's say that I wasn't using the new Unity input system here. Maybe like in Code Monkey's video, he points out when he writes a game, he first gets it working with the old input system, and then he'll go back and refactor it to use a better input system, like the new input system. Um, if I had implemented this using the old input system, I could just change this implementation and then the consumer doesn't care because it doesn't know what's firing these events or what's populating this vector too. It just knows that, hey, I have a movement in the X direction, let me handle it. It doesn't care where that movement came from. So it allows you to refactor. Um, it allows you to have multiple implementations of the same interface that you can just swap out willy nilly without breaking the contract, without affecting the downstream consumption of that contract. Hello, future Greg here. I just remembered something that I meant to include in the video that I forgot. Another way to think of this abstraction layer is that it is a proxy. It is a proxy that intermediates between the player input and the consumption of the player input. Um, and if I had named it that way, uh, maybe called it player input proxy or player input manager proxy, maybe it wouldn't have been as confusing to Andrew because it isn't really another player input manager. It's really a proxy between the input manager and anything that consumes it. So I hope that clarifies that. So the other big issue that I pointed out, the benefit I should say, is that you can make your code testable by abstracting things like this, by having the separation of concern. So if I go over here into my Defender project, I've got these unit tests and I have these play mode tests and under there I have player ship movement tests. And so for example, I've got player ship move up test. Well, I'm actually running the test. I meant to open the code, but hey, you get to watch it run. It'll actually pop up a ship on the screen, move it up and then say, hey, the test passed. So let's go ahead and edit that code and in my test setup here, I am creating a mock or a substitute for I user input. So in my Defender series, instead of having I player input manager, I've got I user input, but it's very, very similar. I have all these events um, and these properties that are exposed by this interface. And so any implementation of that interface just has to implement those interfaces, you know, fire those events and populate those properties. So all I have to do in my move up test is check to see if, um, well, actually I just simulate movement. I just say up press returns true. So when the player ship checks to see, hey, did they press up? Yes. Oh, okay. Let me move my ship um, up. And then in my test, I just say, hey, did he move up? Is my Y index greater than zero? Cause I spawned him at zero. Um, so yeah, the implementation of the player ship doesn't care where that input came from. He's just gonna 
handle whatever input he receives. And so to see that here, um, it's the same exact pattern that I used for my, my bird mover. Um, so handle on move, I just basically checked to see if I had an input, you know, on whatever axis and so forth. It, it doesn't care where that input came from. So I hope you can see the benefits to abstracting your user input in that way. It adheres to solid principles. It's the inversion of dependency using dependency injection in this case. It is a separation of concerns by decoupling and abstracting. Um, and the benefits are you can refactor without changing the implement, how it's consumed, how your consumers implement themselves. You can swap out implementations, again, without affecting the downstream consumers of it. And you can make your code testable because you make it so you can mock that implementation. So we found that useful and I really hope you did. Do me a favor and click the like and subscribe button. It really does help to grow my channel and I'm getting close to a thousand subs. So please do that. Head over to my Steam page and wishlist Highland Panic and give it a try. You can play test it there. And also I'll put links so you can join the beta program on iOS for the uh, iPhone. And also very soon it will be open beta for Android on Google Play. And finally, I want to point out, in case you missed it, I had the great pleasure of appearing as a guest on Jason Wyman's Game Dev Show. I'll put a link to that video below. I was very fortunate to be on a show and get to talk about Highland Panic and my design and development process and how I plan to release it and market it and all that. I hope you'll find that interesting. Well, thanks so much for watching and good luck on your game development journey.